Hi, good evening and welcome. I'm Nora Kane. I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library, and it's my pleasure to have you here this evening for a community lecture on living better with heart failure. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Randall Stafford. Dr. Stafford is a professor of medicine at the Stanford Prevention Research Center, and he is an epidemiologist, a health services researcher, and a primary care internist. His research focuses on patient and physician interventions to improve chronic disease prevention and the mechanisms by which physicians adopt new prevention practices. And it's Dr. Stafford's idea that we would have these Living Better series. So um, I'm very excited to have this talk tonight and I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Stafford. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Thanks you. Thank you so much, Nora. And uh, it's great to have folks online, uh, looking in on this uh, symposium. And I wanna just give a little background about what we're trying to achieve here. And uh, for tonight, I'm very honored to be able to be joined by my colleague, Jeff Tudeberg, who's a cardiologist and heart failure specialist. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a few minutes. But I wanted to give an idea of why we think it's important to delve into these issues of chronic disease. If we look at how chronic disease has been treated and how traditionally the healthcare system has dealt with chronic disease, in many ways, there are a lot of failures there. Uh, our healthcare system doesn't necessarily empower patients to be involved in their care and to take a hold of the disease conditions and disease management strategies that they need to. And in many ways, although things are changing slowly, we still are in a world where the patient is the client and the physician is the authority. And uh, I think that needs to change. And one way of changing that is to reach out, as we're doing today, to offer more information and more dialogue around chronic disease. I, I want to acknowledge that my colleague, Dr. Bryant Lynn, was very much at the forefront of thinking about this series. And as Bryant and I thought about this, we had two goals. One is to really increase the involvement of patients with chronic disease in their care and try to empower them to thrive despite the chronic medical conditions they have. And then second, we want to learn from you, patients out there, what are the questions that are unanswered? What are the needs that you have that the healthcare system isn't necessarily um, meeting? So tonight, I'm really pleased to talk a little bit about the issue of heart failure. It can be a complicated topic, but I want to emphasize that Heart failure doesn't mean that your heart is stopped or that you need to stop doing things that put some um, work on your heart. But it causes a condition where there are lots of complicated medications, lots of tests, and lots of things that need to be done. But nonetheless, I believe that heart failure is a very treatable condition and that in some ways we ought to do better than we're doing now. Really to help me and to lead us in this discussion is my colleague, Jeff Tudeberg. So Jeff is a cardiology um, professor at Stanford. He came to Stanford in 2017 and currently heads the division that is concerned not only with heart failure, but also with heart transplantation and the use of dev devices that give the heart a bit of a boost. Uh, Jeff is one of my esteemed colleagues and someone who I look up to for advice on heart failure. So without any further delay, I'm gonna have Jeff take it away here and provide a little background on heart failure. Then we'll come back together and have some dialogue on issues in heart failure and do our best to try to get to all of the questions that you have. So I'd very much encourage you, even as Jeff starts, to begin asking questions, those things that uh, you need more information on or those things that just aren't clear to you. So with that, take it away, Jeff. 
Good evening, and I really appreciate the invitation to, uh, to speak with you this evening, and um, I appreciate everybody taking time out of their evening to join us as well. I'm going to just share my screen here very quickly. So we just wanted to start tonight with maybe a 15 or 20 minute introduction to what exactly heart failure is. Um, so what am I going to cover in my talk? So I'll see if I can get my slides to advance here. There we go. So what is heart failure? I'll describe a little bit what it is. I'll talk a little bit about the sort of broad types of heart failure and the risk factors for those types of heart failure. Talk a little bit about outcomes briefly touch on treatments, and then talk a little bit about sort of the future, and then we'll enter into discussion, hopefully an interactive discussion with you to talk a little bit about what this means for you. So what is heart failure? So there's a lot of things that can cause heart failure, but in the end, they all result in the same group of symptoms. And so what are those symptoms? So those symptoms are, as you can see in this cartoon, they can be shortness of breath, they can be swelling in your legs or swelling in your belly. They can be fatigue, particularly chronic fatigue. It can be difficulty breathing, not only with exertion, but sometimes at night, you have to sleep at the head of your bed uh, propped up in order to breathe comfortably. Um, and it can be other things like cough, particularly a dry cough at night, or even um, confusion or impaired memory. So it can cause a lot of different symptoms. So what about the scope of the problem? Why do we talk a lot about heart failure and why do you hear a lot about heart failure in the lay press? Well, one is because it's really common. Um, if you look at adults age 40 and above, about 20% or one in five people will develop heart failure at some point in their lifetime. If you look at that from just a couple of years ago in 2015, there were about 6 million people um, with, with heart failure in the country. Uh, and that's estimated to go up to almost 8 million in another 10 years or so. So about a 40% increase over a relatively short period of time. Heart failure is some, something that's everywhere in the country, but there's areas that are it's more prevalent, meaning that it's more common than others. Um, in the sort of the south and through the Appalachia Mountains, it tends to be a little bit more common. But again, this is disease that's just spread throughout the entire country. So you can't really go very far without running into somebody who has been diagnosed with heart failure. Not only is heart failure common, but it's also really costly. And that's why it's a focus of not only insurers, but the government as well in terms of thinking how we can manage people and give them good care and not have it cost quite so much money. If you look at 2015, it's a little over $14 billion is the projected cost of taking care of people with heart failure. And again, in just another 10 years in 2030, it's estimated to be almost $30 billion. And the big part of the, the biggest chunk of that cost is when people come into the hospital. It's estimated right around 80% of the cost of managing heart failure is when people are hospitalized. But there's also other costs for you know, missing work and uh, losing productivity at home and, and, and things uh, as a result of premature mortality. And if you look at those costs, that's about another $8 billion in 2015, and it's estimated to go up to another $12 billion by 2030. So about $30 billion in sort of direct costs and then maybe another 12 billion in indirect costs. So you can see that it's really, really uh, something that taxes the overall healthcare system. When you look at patients that have heart failure, it's not surprising that when you say, ask them questions like, does it impact your ability to travel? Or does it affect your relationship? Or does it affect your ability to sort of enjoy life and participate in hobbies or family events? You can see here the, the percentage of people that say yes is you know, reasonably high, and that's not terribly surprising. But one of the other things we have to kind of keep in mind is that the people who help care for the patients with heart failure also bear a substantial burden. When we ask those folks the same questions, you can see that they're actually more likely to report all of those things than the patients themselves. So not only are we trying to care for the, for the person, but we need to make sure that their caregivers are also attended to as well. And lastly, when you look at things like anxiety and depression, which are really common with heart failure, regardless of the cause, caregivers unfortunately also experience those, those same symptoms of anxiety and depression, and sometimes at higher rates than the patients themselves. But some of the key challenges to managing heart failure is patients don't feel well, and so it's very difficult to do things like get motivated. Um, some patients don't have the support that they need to really take care of themselves or help maximize their care. And not only is it expensive for the healthcare system, but it could be expensive for patients as well. 
there's lots of questions and, and as you heard earlier, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to get smarter about heart failure and to learn more about their disease state. And this is a graph that was put together by the American Heart Association, just looking at search terms on their website for heart failure. And you can see people asking a lot of things. How do, what does my diet do? How does it impact my exercise? What about weight gain? or flying or intimacy or work. And so people have a lot of questions because it really uh, has a big burden, not only just on your life, but on your life outside of home as well. So a little bit of a quick physiology lesson as I talk to you about the kinds of heart failure. I won't get into to the gory details, but just so you understand where the terms come from. So you can see on the, on the screen, there's a pictures of a heart sort of cut in half. And the blue side is where the, 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 vein, the venous blood comes in. So that's blood that comes from your body after it's taken away nutrients and oxygen. And then it goes to the lungs and goes to the lungs and gets oxygen and comes back to the left side of the heart. So let's sort of trace it out real quickly. So blood comes back from your, your head and arms and legs, and it goes into the top right chamber of the heart. That's called the right atrium. And that is then pumped into the bottom right chamber of your heart. That's called the right ventricle. And then that ventricle is a little bit more muscular and its job is to pump that blood then into the lungs and get it oxygen. Once that blood has oxygen in it, then it comes back to the heart, but on the left side this time. So it first comes back to the left upper chamber of the heart, which is the left atrium. And then it comes into the left ventricle. And we'll be talking a lot about the left ventricle today because that's sort of the, the, the focus of how we divide the couple of major forms of heart failure. So the left ventricle is the main pumping chamber of the heart that's responsible for pumping that blood that has oxygen in it to the rest of your body. And you can feel the action of that left ventricle squeezing whenever you feel your pulse in your arm or in your neck or in your leg. And you can see that once that, that, that part of the heart squeezes, it squeezes that blood to the rest of you. And then the cycle repeats itself. So there's two main types of heart failures, and there's a lot of sort of subcategories of these two main types, and there's some other more unusual diseases too, but I think we can focus on these two main types. So if this is a picture of a normal heart in the middle of the screen, the first is heart failure, what we call a reduced EF. So EF stands for ejection fraction. So what does that mean? Well, what an ejection fraction is, is basically how much blood enters your heart and what percentage of it is squeezed out when the heart contracts. So a normal isn't 100%, so you don't get rid of 100% of the blood that enters your heart. Normal is about 60%. So anything less than 60% is a reduced ejection fraction. And typically we think about patients with reduced ejection fractions having an ejection fraction of about 40% or less. And so those, in those patients, the heart muscle is weak, and so it doesn't squeeze the way that it should. So we call that systolic heart failure, and systolic just means systole is the squeezing time of your heart, um, and sometimes called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, kind of known as HEFREF. I'm not a big fan of that name because it's sort of hard to say and it sort of sounds funny, but either way, either way you call it, I think people understand what you're talking about. The other main type is a preserved ejection fraction. So these patients, the squeezing function of their heart is normal, but it's just that their heart can't relax. And it may seem a little bit hard to sort of think about that, but the heart needs to do two things. It needs a squeeze, obviously, to push the blood forward, but it has to be able to relax and accept the blood from the lungs as well. And if it can't do that, you can run into the same problems. And when you have heart failure, basically what happens is the pressure builds up behind the left ventricle, either because it's not squeezing very well or because it's stiff. And the first place that pressure goes is into your lungs. And that extra pressure into your lungs can cause fluid to leak out into your lungs and make you short of breath. If heart failure goes on for a long time, that pressure can then go back to the right side of the heart and into your veins. And when that happens, you can get things like swelling in your legs or swelling in your belly. And so this second kind of heart failure is, is diastolic heart failure. And diastole is the relaxing phase of the heart cycle. And it's also called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, hef pef. So what does this look like? So I get a couple of pictures just to sort of show you what I'm talking about. So these are echocardiograms, which are ultrasounds of patients' hearts. And just to kind of orient you a little bit, I'll see if, this, if I can make my pointer work here. The ultrasound probe is up here where the, where the bright sort of red light is. And the chamber right in the middle here that is the main squeezing chamber of the heart is the left ventricle that I mentioned before. That's the part of the heart that squeezes blood to the rest of the body after it's gotten some uh, oxygen from the lungs. And this is what a normal heart looks like. You can see that not all the blood gets squeezed out of the heart. It squeezes, but the walls don't touch each other. So a normal ejection fraction, again, is around 60%. 
So this is somebody with systolic dysfunction or heart failure with reduced EF. So again, the, the, the pointer, the red dot is in the left ventricle. You can see here that it doesn't squeeze nearly as well. And it's also much bigger than the one that you just saw. And this is a patient with diastolic dysfunction. The, the pointer remains inside the left ventricle. You can see in this time, it looks like it squeezes well, but you can see how much thicker the walls are from here. If you particularly look in this part of the heart, how much thicker those are compared to the picture from a, 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 the normal heart. And that means oftentimes that the heart is very stiff, although the heart doesn't have to be very, very thick to also be stiff. So a couple other things you may hear uh, when you visit your doctor or when you hear uh, uh, your loved ones talk about their heart failure is New York Heart Association class. And that's just kind of a rough way for us to tell how symptomatic patients are with heart failure. So New York Heart Association class one means that you don't, don't have any symptoms at all. You can do whatever you want. Um, you may just have some sort of uh, cardiac abnormal, heart abnormality. Your heart may not squeeze as well or may be stiff, but you don't have any limitations as a result of that. Patients who are class two have limitations, but typically only when they do moderate or heavy exercise. Class three are patients that have symptoms, typically breathlessness, when they do mild exercise. And then class four patients are uh, symptomatic even at rest when they're not doing anything. There's also stages of heart failure, which is a little bit different, um, but, they, but they're sort of complementary to one another. So stages of heart failure talk about how abnormal your heart is. So, Stage A means that your heart is normal, but you have risk factors, which we'll talk about in a second, for heart failure. So you don't have heart failure just yet. When you get to stage B, it means your heart is abnormal, but you haven't yet developed symptoms. Stage C is you have both an abnormal heart and symptoms. And then stage D is end stage heart failure. So let's talk a little bit about diastolic heart failure, heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So what are potential causes? So things that can make the mu heart muscle thicker, such as high blood pressure, when your heart is squeezing against the high blood pressure, the muscle can get thicker over time. So that can cause diastolic heart failure. Things that cause scarring of the heart um, or deposition of, uh, of material between the heart muscle cells themselves uh, and diabetes can lead to this sort of uh, scarring. The other thing that can lead to scarring in the heart is coronary artery disease or heart blockages. People who've had a heart attack and stents can be uh, uh, susceptible to diastolic heart failure. And another common cause of diastolic heart failure, something that makes it worse, are heart rhythm problems. Uh, typically heart rhythms that go fast, but sometimes heart rhythms that go slow. So what are some of the risk factors for diastolic heart failure? Well, there's a lot of them actually. So high blood pressure that I already mentioned, atrial fibrillation, which is a heart rhythm abnormality of the top chambers of the heart, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, obesity. And then there's a lot of associated conditions that aren't problems with the heart, but can cause problems with diastolic heart failure or make symptoms worse. So lung disease, kidney disease, smoking, alcohol, drugs, sleep apnea, and even anemia. So all these things are relatively common, not surprisingly, making diastolic heart failure reasonably common as well. So what about treatments for diastolic heart failure? Unfortunately, there's not a lot of great treatments for the stiff heart muscle itself. It's usually, think, it's usually treating the things that cause diastolic heart failure, like high blood pressure. The other thing that uh, everybody gets for diastolic heart failure and systolic heart failure are diuretics, so medicines that make you go to the bathroom that help you pee out that extra fluid that you tend to hold on to. But like I said, the keystone to management of diastolic heart failure for the most part is managing the things, the risk factors that cause diastolic heart failure or that can make your symptoms worse. What about systolic heart failure? There's kind of two main causes of systolic heart failure. There's a group of people who have totally normal heart arteries. So they don't have any blockages at all. They've never had a heart attack. And these people typically have a problem with the muscle itself. And the more we learn about these folks, the more and more we see that they may be related to their genes and may be passed on from one family member to another family member uh, from generation to generation. The other big group of patients with systolic heart failure are patients who have had blockages in their heart arteries. And so they've had heart attacks or they've had bypass surgery and they've had an injury to their heart muscle. And so the heart muscle has been replaced with scar and so it can't squeeze as well anymore because that muscle has been irreversibly damaged. 
In contrast to diastolic heart failure or, or heart failure with a preserved EF, systolic heart failure, there's actually a lot of good evidence for a lot of different medicines. And you can see them all in here, and I won't go through them in gory detail, but uh, there's been a, a lot of studies over the past 20 years, and we keep seeming like every three or four to five years, we add something else, the sort of newest kid on the block are the SGLT2 inhibitors you can see there. They were actually medicines that were designed for diabetes, but we found out they're actually good for patients with heart failure, even patients with heart failure that don't have diabetes. And lastly, with systolic heart failure, there's some device therapies as well. One is called a defibrillator, and that you can see that in the upper left-hand corner. Patients who have a weak heart muscle for long periods of time, despite good medical therapy, are at risk for funny fast rhythms in the bottom part of the heart. They may not cause any symptoms at all. They may cause palpitations. Um, they may cause people to pass out. But if they go fast enough for long enough, they can actually cause sudden death. And what the defibrillator does is watch your heart 24 hours a day and looks for these funny fast rhythms. It can either shock your heart back into a normal rhythm or pace your heart even faster to try to get it back into a normal rhythm. There's also a group of people who not only have a weak heart muscle, but their heart muscle is a little bit uh, inefficient, meaning that one side of the heart squeezes and then the other side of the heart squeezes instead of both squeezing at the same time. And for some people, you can actually pace both sides of the heart at the same time, and that can make people feel better, and that can actually make people's heart function get better over time. And that's called resynchronization therapy. And lastly, we're sort of introducing more and more gadgets into managing patients with heart failure, particularly trying to manage them from afar. Um, we're developing sy systems like you see on the bottom there, which are implantable devices that go inside your lung arteries that measure your pressures inside of your heart and then give us a sense of sort of how you're doing over time and maybe even notice that you're gaining fluid weight before you even notice it in your symptoms. So maybe we can use these sorts of devices in the future to help keep people out of the hospital and prevent them from having to come back in and their disease pro process progressing. So with that, you know, heart failure is very, very common. It's very, very costly, not only to the healthcare system, but to patients and families as well. Regardless of why you have heart failure, the symptoms are essentially the same, whether it's systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. The different types, as I mentioned, systolic and diastolic, but there's lots of other things that can cause heart failure too, and maybe we can get into that a little bit later on. The treatments differ by why you have heart failure, with the exception of diuretics. Um, so it's important to kind of understand why you have heart failure, and then that will help us decide sort of what the best treatments are. But the big thing is prevention. A lot of the things that lead to both systolic and diastolic heart failure are very preventable. And there's things that you can do to maintain a healthy lifestyle to hope prevent you from being one of the people that develop heart failure in the course of your life. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and I'll turn the talk back over to Randy. Hey, thank you so much, Jeff. That was a great introduction to, to heart failure. Um, I want to start out asking a few questions that, you know, questions that have come from my own patients about heart failure. So one of the typical questions is, what can I do to make myself healthier, uh, live uh, a better life despite having heart failure. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of drugs and obviously taking those drugs is really important and quite hard to do. I have to say that I think all physicians sort of underestimate how difficult it is to adhere to a, a complicated, complicated set of medications. Uh, but I wanted to kind of go one by one through some of the things that, you know, maybe patients can do to help themselves and to help in the the treatment of their heart failure. So what about diet? What are the things about diet that uh, are important for heart failure patients to keep in mind? And granted, you know, some of these uh, advice might vary depending on the, whether it's uh, diastolic or systolic heart failure, uh, but what are some of the things in terms of what people eat that uh, can be important? I mean, I, th I think the, the couple simple things are um, you have to watch your salt intake. Uh, the more salt that you take in, uh, the more likely it is to sort of hold on to fluid in your body. And once you start holding on to that fluid, then you start getting the symptoms of heart failure, like breathlessness and swelling. Um, you know, it's, it's, you have to start to learn to how to read labels a little bit about how much salt is in, are in things. And I think that's important to, to be able, not only for you, but for your family. I think it can be pretty eye-opening once you start realizing how much salt are in foods, particularly prepared foods and canned foods. 
another another place where there's tends to be a lot of salt that it's hard to even know how much salt there there is is when you go out to dinner uh, a lot of the things that make uh, food tastes good at your favorite restaurant is salt um, so you need to be you need to be careful the other the other thing is fluid intake um, generally speaking we say patients should try not to drink more than a couple liters of fluid today and when you talk about sodium they say 2,000 um, milligrams or two grams of sodium now that's a little bit simplified you know if you have heart failure but you have very mild symptoms and you don't require much in the way of a water pill to keep your fluid off, you may be able to eat a little bit more salt and drink a little bit more than someone who has more severe disease that requires more intensive medication and then has had frequent hospitalizations. So it's tailored a little bit. But, you know, two liters, what I tell my patients, is, you know, we, we're used to dealing with the English system, not the metric system. So what does two liters mean? Um, I always tell people to get, you know, either save or ask one of your friends or neighbors to bring over a, a two liter bottle of whatever water or coke whatever that's empty and then just put it next to your sink and in the morning when you have your cup of coffee or two cups of coffee when you've done drinking them as whatever you had in coffee or tea then fill that mug back up to the same level and dump it into the two liter bottle and then at lunchtime when you have your drink of iced tea fill your iced tea cup back up with water when you're done and dump that into the two liter bottle and do that over the course of the day for a couple of days and it doesn't take long to kind of get a sense just from a couple of days of doing this of how much you can drink and how much you can't drink. So two liters is more than you think it is. Um, but for some people, it is, it is a limitation. So why is it that both uh, sodium intake or salt intake and fluid intake are important for people with heart failure? What, 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 are, the, what are we doing when we, we overdo it with both of those things? Yeah, so one of the things that happens when you have heart failure, regardless of the cause, is that your heart sing sends out signals to your body and to your kidneys in particular to hold on to fluid. Um, and in the short term, from the standpoint of evolution, that was a good thing. But over the long term, particularly when you have your heart muscles abnormal for long periods of time, that those signals just make you hold on to more and more fluid and make you more breathless and feel more fatigued and have more swelling. And so the more salt that you take in, the more likely it is you're going to hold on to fluid inside your body. The more fluid that you drink makes it more difficult for your kidneys to get rid of that extra fluid. Now, you know, we never tell anybody to stop drinking because um, you need to have, you need to drink some during the course of the day. And that's why we use the water pills, the diuretics to help you get rid of some of the extra. But if you can think about every day that you tend to hold on to a little bit more fluid, we need you to get we need you to pee a little bit more fluid in every day than you drink, just to kind of keep you a little bit on the negative side so you don't build up fluid over time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess in some sense, what you're saying is under normal circumstances, our bodies are pretty able to deal with salt and with, uh, with lots of fluid. But heart failure is a special condition where our body kind of loses the ability to process those components of our diet. And uh, if we don't look after those things, then we start having worsened symptoms uh, with, uh, with heart failure. Yeah, and the other, <clears throat> and the other thing that can complicate heart failure management, both with systolic and diastolic heart failure, is that some degree of kidney dysfunction is really common with both. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sometimes as a result of other diseases, sometimes as a result of the diseases that also led to the heart failure. And the more kidney dysfunction you have, the more difficult sometimes it can be to manage your fluids. And so your margin for error becomes much less. And so it can become more and more difficult over the time if you have more and more kidney dysfunction. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one thing I often tell my patients, both with and without heart failure, is that eating a relatively heart healthy diet is good because many of the factors that play into creating heart failure and making it worse are the same things that you know we can uh, we can prevent by watching our diet and doing doing other good things for ourselves so no absolutely i totally agree with that and like you said a lot of the things that are risk factors for heart failure are also uh, benefited by uh, having you know a good diet um, you know, there are some people that develop heart failure that, uh, for reasons that are completely independent of that, but at the same time, it's still good not to become overweight because that just taxes your heart even further and makes you more likely to develop things like high blood pressure and diabetes. So even if, even if you didn't have uh, 
some of those risk factors and you develop heart failure, it still makes a lot of sense and it's good practice to you know, watch your diet and eat a good diet. You know, the other thing that's important for not only pe everybody, but it, people with heart failure in particular is to exercise. Um, that may seem a little bit counterintuitive for some people. Yeah. Say, geez, you know, I feel short of breath and I don't feel so great. You know, isn't it bad to be exercising or my heart muscle is weak? Won't I hurt it more by exercising? Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot of evidence that shows that uh, one of the best things you can do for yourself is stay active. Or, you know, one of the first things that we do for people is try and get them in the cardiac rehab if possible, or at least a structured exercise program, because that's good for heart failure, whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure. And there's a lot of other benefits to your body as well. You get the same benefits in terms of you know, keeping your weight down and less likelihood develop to, to develop some of these other diseases. But um, staying active and aerobically active is important. So just because you have heart failure uh, doesn't mean you get to uh, kind of not do other things. You want you to kind of get out there and enjoy your life and do aerobic exercises. So whether that's walking or walking on a treadmill or swimming or biking, I know that things are a little bit more complicated these days with, with the, the whole COVID epidemic, but you know, even just walking around the block um, or walking your dog is a good way to just get out and, and exercise yourself. So let's say I wanted to get started. Uh, you know, currently not very active, been holed up, sheltering in place. Uh, but, you know, you're telling me that physical activity is a good thing. What are your tips for getting started? So a lot of times the easiest way to get started is with formal cardiac rehab. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes there's issues with payment for that. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is before we refer people or while we're referring them is just to check and make sure that the out-of-pocket cost isn't too much. It's a reality. Sometimes it just can be very expensive. Um, and the nice thing about cardiac rehab is that it's, it's a sort of a supervised structured exercise program. You start kind of low intensity and there's someone watching you there and encouraging you and monitoring you. And then when you quote unquote graduate from the program, they give you uh, uh, sort of instructions about sort of how to continue to, to, to do your thing. That being said, it's as simple as even just, if, if you haven't been doing anything, just go for a short walk and go for a short walk every day or most days of the week and to do that short week, short walk for a couple of weeks. And then after a couple of weeks, go a little bit further. You know, I always tell everybody, let your body be your guide. Some days you might, your body may say, Hey, geez, you know, and, and you know, enough, I can't do this anymore. And then you stop and take a break or, or you go back. And some days you may feel like doing a little bit more and that's okay too. Um, but you don't want to go from zero to 60 right away. If you haven't been exercising, particularly if you have a new diagnosis of heart failure. But I think starting simple, it doesn't have to be anything super complex. You don't need to go out and buy expensive equipment. Um, you know, just a pair, of, a pair of shoes is usually enough to kind of get you going. Yeah, you, uh, that makes a lot of sense, particularly that idea that you want to ramp up gradually and listen, you know, how your, heart, your, your body is, uh, is responding to that physical activity. Uh, you talked mostly about aerobic exercise. Are there any sorts of exercise that, people shouldn't do because of heart failure? Let's say weightlifting or, or other types of exercise beyond aerobic exercise. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I moved, as you mentioned, I moved here in 2017 from the East Coast where there used to be a lot of snow. So what I used to tell people is, um, you know, don't shovel snow. That's like the first thing that everybody recognizes <laughs> they shouldn't do. So I can't tell that to people here because they don't know exactly what I'm talking about unless they go up to the mountains. Um, but I always, the other thing I tell people is anything that you're really it's making you sort of grunt um, because it's, you're, you're exerting yourself is probably something you should stay away from. So, you know, some people say, well, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm getting kind of flabby and I'd like to kind of build up a little bit of muscle tone. And I think that's okay, but I'd rather have you to use multiple repetitions of very light five pound weights than go to the gym and try and do squats or do bench presses. Because anything where you're really grunting and really sort of holding your breath and trying to push really hard can increase the load on your heart and increase the work that your heart has to do. But if you do light weights with lots of repetitions, that's almost aerobic work or very, very much is aerobic work and build it up a little bit of strength and, and get a little bit of tone doing that kind of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. What about other lifestyle type of things, other health behaviors? Um, you know, I talk a lot with my patients about sleep, about stress and potential for relaxation. Um, you know, I, I talk about kind of the, the need for social support. You've mentioned a few of those things. I'm wondering if you go over in more detail, what are the other kind of lifestyle 
uh, features that might help or in some cases hurt heart failure? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it sounds uh, almost not super scientific, but all those things you talked about, all the things that when you, when you go to the doctor and you're feeling fine, they, they tell you to watch out for. Uh, sleep, uh, not smoking, you know, staying active, mm -hmm. exercising. Um, I, I, those things are all really important. And I, you know, I think it's also important, um, you know, maybe even more important these days just to maintain social contact. Um, Cause you know, there can be, when you're sick, you can get a sense of isolation. And in today's world that may happen faster than, than, it, than it would otherwise. And so I think all those sorts of things, staying engaged, and, you know, hopefully we can work with you to reduce your symptoms so that you can get out there and still travel and still see your family and still do the things that you like to do. I think staying engaged with the world is, is really, really important in addition, in addition to sort of taking care of yourself. Great. I wanted to shift a little bit. We have a question that's come in about the role of diuretics. And yeah. we talked a little bit about that in, in mentioning fluid and and salt or sodium, uh, but what is the role of diuretics? And uh, one specific question I have here is, you know, if I use diuretics, are those going to hurt my kidneys? Are my kidneys going to get burnt out from that extra work they're doing? Yeah, it's, it's a common question and a common concern. So it's, you know, when there's some people who have weak heart muscles um, that don't require any diuretics at all, or they do find their kidneys manage and they just manage with uh, managing their fluid and salt intake. Um, but most patients require some dose of diuretics, again, because their bodies just tend to hold on to fluid. And so we need to, you know, goose the kidneys just a little bit to see if we can get rid of that fluid. Now, it can be true that if we push too hard or too fast or both, that the kidneys don't always like that. And they can, you can cause kidney dysfunction by pushing too hard or too fast. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, if you, if you don't get off enough fluid and you walk around with extra fluid in you, that can hurt your kidneys as well. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not, uh, people don't appreciate that quite as much, but we oftentimes see people come into the hospital and when we uh, get rid of their fluid, their kidney function actually gets better. So it's important that you uh, work with your doctor. That you, one of the other important things is just weighing yourself every day. It's kind of the early warning system to make sure that you're Kind of within a range of your uh, what we call your dry weight um, and as you're gaining weight if you gain a couple of pounds or three pounds overnight or five pounds over the course of a couple of days it doesn't matter what you ate it's fluid now it, it may matter a little bit about what you ate if it was full of salt um, but that extra weight gain it isn't sort of the fat or the carbohydrates that you ate it's the it's the salt and fluid that you ate um, so, you know, it's important that that's something that you can, you can follow along as well so you don't get yourself too dried out. So it, we follow patients' labs pretty closely, particularly if you already have some kidney dysfunction, we may follow your labs a little bit uh, more closely. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of people, like I said, who have heart failure and also a fair amount of kidney dysfunction and they're seeing kidney doctors. And sometimes there can be a lot of discussion back and forth between the kidney doctors and the, and the heart doctors about how much diuretics and how frequently we should give them. But we're just trying to find that that balance between getting enough fluid out of you so that you don't have so many so many symptoms, but not getting too much out too fast so that your kidneys stay happy. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important, particularly that advice about paying attention to your weight and uh, sudden shifts in your weight really should be uh, paid attention to and uh, a good good uh, indicator to talk to your doctor. Now, you know, weight is among one of many numbers that sometimes patients are asked to, uh, you know, to deal with. You also mentioned the, the lab test for kidney function, another thing that we, we often follow very closely. In terms of the issue of the severity of heart failure, you know, I know that for the systolic heart failure or the reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Usually it's the ejection fraction that's sort of the best measure of how heart failure is doing. And, you know, we obviously would like people to maintain the same ejection fraction, that is not lose any ejection fraction. There are occasionally people who actually have a, a little bit of a rebound in the heart failure in their uh, ejection fraction, which can be good. But I'm still a little confused about how we measure 
the severity of heart failure when it's the preserved ejection fraction, that is the, uh, the diastolic type of heart failure. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and sort of are there numbers we should be following there? Yes, I mean, even getting back to the issue of patients with systolic heart failure and the lower ejection fractions, um, just because you have a low ejection fraction doesn't mean that you necessarily have symptoms of heart failure. If you remember the, the slides that the sort of class, the sort of AHA class three, two heart failures, people who have structural abnormalities or have some sort of heart dysfunction, but don't yet have symptoms. And even if your ejection fraction is low, I have, you know, my, I, all I see in clinic are patients with heart failure. So I have a lot of patients in my clinic with low ejection fractions that they have little to no uh, limitations in what they do. And so I think that there's, um, some conflating low ejection fraction with you must be feeling bad. Um, mm -hmm. and who have low ejection fractions, they say, geez, my doctor wonders how I'm still alive. Um, <laughs> there's lots of people that do very well with low ejection fractions with today's medicines for years and years and years with some with very few and very little in the way of symptoms. Um, and as you mentioned, there's also a, a not insubstantial group of people with systolic heart failure, particularly the people who have no blockages, whose heart function gets substantially better or nearly normalizes with a combination of medical and device-based therapy. So it's not like it's something that's completely irreversible either. But what do we follow over time? It's mostly symptoms, uh, to be honest with you, uh, particularly in diastolic heart failure. There are things that you can look at in the ultrasound of the heart that can give you a sense of are the valves becoming more leaky? There's ways of estimating pressures with inside, inside the heart. There's ways of estimating how well the heart actually relaxes, uh, the mm -hmm. senses of there's disease progression or not. But even if you have that and you still feel fine and you're doing whatever you want to without any limitations, it doesn't necessarily mean I'll change therapies. Um, so mostly we follow patient's symptoms and how they're doing and how they compare to uh, a year ago or three months ago or whenever we saw them last in clinic. Now, there are some more uh, specialized heart failure tests. There's a specialized heart failure exercise test that we can, that we can have uh, people do, kind of cardiopulmonary exercise stress test, sort of a fancy name for just walking on a treadmill. Um, but that gives us some numbers that give us a sense of how much exercise you can do compared to your imaginary twin with a normal heart. And sometimes we use that for people who are of, have fairly advanced heart failure. We, it's not a test that we do for everybody. Um, usually once we start doing those sorts of tests, it's either to try and figure out, are you breathless because of your lung disease or are you breathless because of your heart disease? Or we use that test when patients are getting really sick and we're starting to think about something like heart transplantation. There are also some blood tests that we sometimes use to, to look at heart failure, something called uh, BNP, uh, brain natriuretic protide, or there's, there's another version of an NT pro BMP. They're both sort of the same thing. It's something that the, the heart releases in response to the heart walls being stretched out by extra fluid. And that's something that's sometimes used in the emergency room. And some people use it on a, a now patient basis to get a sense of sort of where you are. Uh, is your BNP level look like you did when you were feeling great? Or does it look like you did when you weren't doing so well? And sometimes that's a helpful, uh, marker to see sort of where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't help but uh, have any discussion these days, at least touch on COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I was just wondering, you know, is heart failure one of those risk factors for getting more severe COVID-19 should you be infected? I mean, I would put it in the, the, the group of diseases that are comorbidities or other illnesses that um, probably put you at increased risk. Um, it probably depends a little bit on how severe your heart failure is to begin with and what other medical problems you have. Um, we know that the big things are age and obesity is another big one. I imagine heart disease and heart failure is, is also a risk factor, but there haven't been a lot of great studies to say that heart failure is worse than say having diabetes or heart failure is yeah. worse than having obesity or heart failure is worse than having uh, COPD. Um, but I think you need to be a little bit more careful. Everybody with other medical problems, I think should be, take a little bit more caution when they think about how to interact with the world these days. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that's worth keeping in the back of your mind. And, and, you know, it can, 
sometimes be that if you have a cough and you're a little bit short of breath, the symptoms can overlap with COVID and frankly, the you know, regular flu. And so you just need to be mindful that not to necessarily ignore those symptoms if you're having them and just say, oh, it's my heart failure. I'm, I'm not going to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. But as I told all my patients, if you feel sick and you're not doing well, the, the place to come is the emergency room. Um, and uh, we, it's, it's hard to... We can help you on the phone to a, to, to a degree, but if you're really struggling to breathe, you know, we still may have you come into the emergency room and the emergency rooms are still, particularly in this area, aren't overwhelmed and they can, you know, we can take care of you and keep you relatively safe. So uh, it's, 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 it is a risk factor, but I'm not sure I can necessarily say how much of a risk factor it is compared to other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and I think that message of anyone with a chronic disease just needs to be more careful and try to avoid those situations where there's a, a, any possibility of transmission of the coronavirus. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. I have a question here that uh, talks about the impact of heart failure on lifespan. And uh, I wonder if you'd go over that a little bit. You know, when I first started uh, you know, my medical school training, heart failure was pretty much a death sentence. It was one of those things where some people did okay, but you could pretty much count on not living more than about five years. And I know that's changed, but uh, can you give us a little rundown on how we are doing now in terms of lifespan for people with heart failure? And what are the things that you think have made the biggest difference? So the, for systolic heart failure, clearly the biggest difference is the medicines. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a blessing and a curse to have so many good medicines. So like you said, sometimes people end up on a lot of different medicines just for their heart failure. Yeah. You mentioned all the other medicines they're on for any other medical problem they have. But that being said, the medicines for systolic heart failure are very good. And there's a lot of them and it keeps people feeling uh, better over longer periods of time. It keeps them out of the hospital. It keeps them alive. And for some people, it makes their heart function get better over time. Um, so it's it's not the sort of you know, sort of death sentence that you mentioned earlier. I think there's a lot of people that live for years and years and years and years and years with even with low ejection fractions. And so it's more sort of how you feel. So the better you feel and the longer you feel good, the better it is you're going to do. So if you have an ejection fraction of 20%, but you do pretty much all the stuff that you want to do and only notice you get breathless and with heavy exertion, and that's the way you've been for five years, you'll probably keep doing well for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why we kind of want to keep an eye on people and particularly want them to tell us when they're not feeling as well, because maybe it's a blip in the road, but you know, maybe it's a, it's a signal that something else is happening. Um, I would say the same thing with diastolic heart failure. Um, it's, it's one of those things that we can manage. Uh, there's not as many medicines for the stiff heart muscle itself, but we can do wonders with managing all the other things that, are, that can make it worse or that can um, make it more likely to happen. And so it's, it's not something that uh, necessarily um, means, a, means a, a shortened life or a very shortened life. You know, that figure of one in five Americans over 40 who develop heart failure in their lifetimes, you know, some people don't develop heart failure until they're, you know, they're 80, they're 85 or 90. And I'm not saying that that's not important, but, you know, there's a lot of their life that they go through without any heart failure at all. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a a lot of sense. Um, You know, one of the issues that this same audience member brings up, which I, I very much agree with, is there's a sense in which just the term heart failure, failure part really uh, is quite a pessimistic one. And I'm wondering, as this audience member uh, does, whether we should be rebranding that. Uh, yes, that, that's, a, that's something that's been sort of haunting the, the field for a long time. And all my friends make fun of me for specializing in failure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it's sort of, I, <laughs> The good news is, is everybody kind of knows what heart failure is. And so it, it's sort of, mm-hmm. when you mention it, it, people know what you're talking about um, or know somebody with it, or at least have some sort of um, experience with it in their lifetime for, from a friend or a loved one or uh, you know, somebody they knew. Uh, there just hasn't been a great replacement for it. Uh, you know, we've come up with all these other kind of crazy names like Hefref and Hefpef. And um, you know, sometimes it sounds like we're speaking a different language. Uh, but you know, I, we should hold a contest actually, and, and see if people can come up with something better. Um, uh-huh. People 
Okay, well, what about hard success? And that sounds a that sounds a little bit too advertisey. Um, so I don't know. We don't have a, we don't have another great name for it. Um, some some people call it you know, the, the when you have a disease of your heart muscle, it's called a cardiomyopathy. Cardio for heart and myopathy, mm-hmm. meaning a muscle problem. And so some people call their clinics the cardiomyopathy clinics, and that sounds very scientific, um, but it also is a little bit opaque and. It's yeah. not entirely sure. It's not. It's one of those things that doesn't have, uh, uh, doesn't ring true. I think to a lot of people in the community. Yeah, I have another question here, which I think is a good one. We're talking about kind of the relationship between diabetes and heart failure, and particularly this idea of you know having to take a lot of medications and needing to kind of check in with the doctors about those medications. Um, you know, is there a relationship and how can people try to break that relationship? As you were talking about before, how can we prevent heart failure among those people with diabetes? Is that the same process as with anyone or are there anything special we should be thinking about with uh, those with diabetes? Well, I mean, you know, I think that it's, it would be, I would probably give the same answer that your endocrinologist or, or, or primary care physicians w- would give you as, you know, aggressively managing your blood sugars. This is the best thing you can do. You know, heart failure can result from longstanding diabetes, you know, but so can problems with your eyes and your nerves and your kidneys and strokes and all, all sorts of other, uh, other bad things. Um, the, the relationship between diabetes and diastolic heart failure is probably a little bit more I don't know, intimate than it is between that and systolic heart failure. Because with systolic heart failure, diabetes tends to lead to coronary artery disease or blockages in your arteries and heart attacks. So it's a little bit more kind of downstream. Whereas I think that um, diabetes can cause stiffness and scarring in the heart uh, and lead to diastolic heart failure without ever really developing heart blockages or any, any of the other bad side effects bad long-term complications of diabetes. So it's really important to, to treat it. And as I mentioned, sort of in that treatment slide, one of the sort of n- new drugs out there that was developed for diabetes also was shown to help with heart failure as well. And so there were fewer heart failure hospitalizations. Not only did people do better from their diabetes, but they had less heart failure. And that got the investigators to say, huh, you know, maybe there's something there. And so then they did, they did trials of people with diabetes and heart failure using medicine and said, oh, wow, yeah, it actually does that. And then they started looking at using it for people without diabetes at all. So uh, there is a little bit of overlap, not only sort of in the risk that it brings, but also potentially in some of the treatments that your doctors may decide to, to try you on. Yeah. And that's nice to, to illustrate that we actually have come up with yet another tool for heart failure. Um, are there any others out there on the horizon that uh, that you're excited about? <laughs> um, there's not a lot of other me- like medical therapies that I think are going to be ready for prime time. I think particularly for for systolic heart failure, one of the problems is is there's so many good therapies that if you want to introduce a new drug, everyone has to be on all those other therapies that already work, and so it's hard to prove benefit on top of everything else. But that being said, the SGLT2 inhibitors, that diabetes medicine I just talked about, that's what it showed. Um, So it's it's not that it's impossible. I think where a lot of the interest and research right now is in diastolic heart failure because there aren't a lot of great medicines that are specifically for the diastolic heart failure. There's lots of medicines for the things that cause it or the things that make it worse. Um, But trial after trial, we really come up short with the exception of a couple of uh, drugs to find combinations of things other than diuretics that keep people out of the hospital and make them do better in the long term that just are focused on their heart muscle itself. So there's a lot of interest there. There's technologies that are being developed for managing people remotely, um, either through uh, Bluetooth devices and their phones and their uh, medicine and their scales at home to sort of help keep an eye on things. Mm-hmm. There's these devices that uh, for patients who have more advanced heart failure that we can potentially implant that monitor your heart pressures and see how you're doing. And maybe, maybe that'll, maybe that can keep people out of the hospital and feeling better and um, can avoid us from giving them too much in the way of diuretics and hurting their kidneys. And there may be a lot of benefits from, from that. So I think the tech, the technological piece is kind of coming online and to not no pun intended but i think that there'll be a lot more technological ways to monitor people and hopefully 
mm. keep them out of the hospital, but also keep them out of the doctor's office. I mean, you know, if we can see somebody and make sure you're doing okay, you don't have to drive three hours for a doctor to say, hey, you're doing okay. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's good for your quality of life, but it's also good for your pocketbook as well. May I interrupt for just a moment, doctor? This is a great conversation. We're getting close to the end of our hour, and I just wanted to tell our viewers that we still have time for another question. So if you have a question, please send it in now, and let's uh, have our doctors have an opportunity to answer that for you now. So just wanted to let people know this has been a wonderful discussion and, and a lot of, lot of uh, subjects covered really thoroughly, I think. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Nora. And uh, again, I, we welcome some questions. Uh, we've had a number already and uh, looking for uh, just another. Jeff, I'm going to put myself on the line here. You know, as a primary care doctor, I'm supposed to know a, a lot about a lot of different conditions. And, uh, you know, it's hard to do that. I'm wondering from your perspective, are there a couple things that you wish primary care doctors knew or would do better with patients who have heart failure? Um, it's a little bit of a loaded question. <laughs> I don't want to cast any stones. Um, <laughs> I, I, think that, I think that one thing that, that we see is that um, sometimes people aren't as aggressive as they could be with getting people on the sort of highest, highest tolerated doses of their medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, a lot of times that will cause people's blood pressures to get sort of low, the top numbers in the 80s or 90s, and, and, and doc physicians and patients and their families start to get worried. I don't worry so much about what that number is, as long as you're not having symptoms, as long as you're not too dizzy, you're not passing out. Um, some people get dizzy and lightheaded when their blood top number of their blood pressure is 100, and some people don't until they're 75. So I, I think we try and be aggressive, and the reason we try to be aggressive is that we've seen from the trials of people with heart failure, particularly systolic heart failure, that the higher doses that we can get you on, as long as you tolerate it and are feeling well, the more likely it is you're going to get benefit. Um, so you know, what's one when people come to clinic, we always sort of see if we can push people as far as we can, and then we kind of bring them back from the from the from the brinks, just mm -hmm. so not feeling too bad. And I think the other thing that's that's Hard not only for us as heart failure professionals, but for primary care physicians and for nephrologists and everybody else is um, being relatively confident about your exam to see if someone has extra fluid in them. Um, and, I, and I think that that's something that uh, is, is, is simple, but can oftentimes be overlooked uh, when managing people. So sometimes people, it, they don't always have the typical symptoms, um, but there's certain exam tricks that you can do to, to, to see that maybe they are actually holding on to fluid when it doesn't really look like they are because they don't have any swelling in their feet. Um, so uh, I think those are probably the two big things. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So we are running out of time here, and I want to just close by, first of all, thanking you, Dr. Jeff Tudeberg, the uh, chief of the heart failure division within cardiology. And uh, also thank Nora for the venue here to talk about how patients can do better with chronic conditions. Um, and I just want to kind of leave you with the message. If you, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to contact the health library at Stanford. This is a great resource. I've really enjoyed working with the health library, and uh, they have people who can help you. And uh, these days, you don't even need to come in in person. So with thank that, you. I'm going to close out our session. And I, I want to thank uh, Nora, thank Jeff, and particularly thank the uh, audience members. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Thanks again. Good, Good night. night.